Moonlight! Moonlight! John Moonlight! Listen to the crowd! You know, once you once you get past that, I think I beat BG three or four times over the years. I, I think I beat every team on the circuit pretty much at this point now. Uh, the guys just knocked off stuff after again. Like once you get that confidence and you start building, and the group was getting confident. It was, there was no one that was going to really well. And seven is one of those games that anything can happen at a certain amount of time. But you know, we felt like every game we were going in, we had a good chance of taking it down and actually performing, walking away. I think it was Sterling Richmond that had the game when he try, and Dallin, you'd be thrilled because he was also wearing gloves when he scored the try. <laughs> <laughs> He's never going to let this down. Oh, <laughs> Hi, I'm John Moonlight. Hi, I'm David Moonlight. Welcome to the Rugby Hive. He's so dangerous, Freddy Krueger has nightmares about him. Hello and welcome to the Rugby Hive. I'm Dallin Stanford and despite my South African accent, I was fortunate enough to play rugby for the United States on the Sevens World Series. And I'm Robin McDowell, a former Canadian Sevens international. Back in my playing days, I went head-to-head against Dallin in the USA. For several years, Robin has coached international sevens for various countries, including Canada and Mexico. He's massively passionate about growing the game across the Americas through his McDool rugby programs at all levels. I'm currently a commentator for World Rugby, most recently broadcasting the Rugby World Cup in Japan, as well as the amazing Sevens World Series. More than a decade later, we are teaming up to bring you insights from legendary players and coaches from around the world. All legends have a story. The Rugby Hive podcast is here to share it. Welcome to the Hive. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 26 of the Rugby Hive Podcast. We're as dangerous as a sneeze in 2021. The world has returned. We've been waiting for this for a long time. We're back to some of the glory days. We've been very busy, of course. Life has got exciting. Lots of traveling, lots of things on the crack. And this episode with two Canadian legends, John and Dave Moonlight, recorded a while ago in 2020. And Robin, these sensations, they've obviously run you over countless times Tell us briefly why you wanted these two quachas on the hive. Well, they're, they're about as Canadian as it gets on and off the field. A couple of Ontario beauties. Uh, David, obviously the older cousin uh, that came through the Canadian Seven system first. Uh, went on to Captain Canada. He was actually my captain, so I played my entire international career with him, as well as we played at university together. But really what, uh, what I took away from this podcast is just how close and how impactful David was on his younger cousin, John Moonlight. John was twice the size of Dave, but just as fast, just about, but... Uh, yeah, the, the thing that really impressed me with the Moonlights and, and when I went onto the field my first game when I debuted against the All Blacks in Dubai is looking at my captain, he was fearless. And he he imposed this, this level of confidence that we could beat anybody. And Dave was part of the first ever Canadian team that upset Fiji. I think it was in 2004, 2005. And then later on, John was part of some many historical wins, but uh, upsetting New Zealand, the All Blacks, for the first time in 2015 in Japan. And what was really impactful about that, Dallin, since that time, I don't have the stats, you're the stats guy, but I believe that Canada's beat New Zealand almost 50% of the time since since that time. And uh, and then ultimately, John was, uh, was, was part of lifting that trophy in 2017 before he retired. So just all in all, just a historical uh, Canadian legends. Yeah, I recall playing against them. It was when they were playing. It was it was really tough to obviously bring them down and tackle them and stuff like that. Um, but uh, that's legendary, pal. And yeah, we'll have to look up that stat against New Zealand. I think when the Moonlights were playing, that was probably a good stat. Right now, it's uh, it's the Kiwis dominating. We'll see how they go, obviously, uh, in the Olympic Games. Pal, let's quickly switch across to what's currently on the go, what's been happening uh, on your side and my side. I'll kick off first. Busy, which is really cool. Lots of traveling. They're going to Austin, Texas and Indianapolis, wherever, whatever state that is in, to do some remote games for Major League Rugby. Lots of prep, but it's been thrilling. Super fun. Get to throw in the one-liners here and there. Get to see some of our Canadian guys in action. Some of obviously our American legends as well, going head to head, which has been brilliant. I feel for the Gasparino, who's been supporting the Toronto Arrows faithfully. They've had a bit of a mixed bag, sometimes going down like a homesick mole. And then... Um, the Eastern Conference Championship and their Western Conference Championship, those are going to be thrilling games coming up uh, later in July. You know, And then outside of that, Rob, the other thing is I've been doing a lot of work, remote work with the Free Jacks, of course, just interviews and things like that with the players and coaches. Well, because of re- restrictions being eased here, particularly in Massachusetts, I'll be able to go in person, have some fun with them and be able to you know, put a couple of goose steps on, get smashed by some of the forwards and give out a couple of haircuts. I think that's going to be very most important. Get Verity Explains out there shredding them, them as well, you know? 
Well, we'll make sure the World Rugby Shop sends you some fresh gloves for that appearance. <laughs> oh, come on. Come <laughs> on. All right, Busy B, what, what's been cracking on your neck of the woods? Uh, just busy uh, with lots of projects. Uh, currently looking for an assistant coach in Canada here to join the MacDool Rugby Island Academy. So just getting fired up with uh, with recruits for this fall. And then obviously my Prairie Academy that's going on in uh, in Saskatchewan. And, and me and the missus are headed, headed that way. Got my spurs packed. So I'm going to be doing some brandings, getting back on some horses. So looking forward to some downtime with family and friends. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant, pal. Listen, we need to get you a high chair as well. I know you're really short, but you're really coming off lower on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sit on a book next week. Then I want to thank all our listeners and supporters of the Rugby Hive. It's been a tremendous 2021, tons of engagement, lots of exciting news we've been releasing. The Rugby Hive is brought to you by Wintergreen. And Wintergreen, who are the legends you ask? Well, Wintergreen, their mission philosophy is to support USA Rugby's mission of uniting an inclusive and passionate rugby community and grow the sport in America and, of course, beyond in North America too, you know. So Wintergreen is synonymous with rugby in South Africa. They've been using as a pregame, postgame, warm-up for decades. And now, of course, they're here in, in the U.S. And, of course, we'll get some through to you in Canada as well. So folks can visit wintergreensport.com. And they're a proud partner of Major Rugby as well and our title partner here at the Rugby Hive. Our clothing store has been going bonkers as well. Uh, we're stronger than the smell of a tuna sandwich. You can click on World Rugby Shop, type in Rugby Hive in the search bar. And Wurschka, 46 items inspired at your fingertips. We don't have any gloves, but we've got a ton of other brilliant things uh, your way. And uh, so many, so many great thanks to, to the legends on that side. Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to our, our brilliant writer, Karen Gasparino, the Gaz, as Dal likes to say. She carved up a, a great story on David Ibanez, and uh, that story's caught some steam. Hey, Dal? Oh, it certainly has. The Maccabee legend, gold, gold medal winning champion and breaking barriers. Um, he's been on the Major League Rugby All Access show, and the Gaz Monster General has been superb just scouting these brilliant stories, connecting with the rugby players, um, and bringing, bringing it to life, really, and sharing it with a huge audience. Um, she is one of our favorites, the Gaz, and of course, brilliant guest she gets on each week. A couple of months ago, she did a story on, on young Lockie Kratz, a, a Canadian young international athlete that uh, you know bought his plane ticket to, to New Orleans, a one-way ticket to hopefully get signed. Got signed after halfway through his second practice and was on the uh, replacement roster. Guy got injured. Uh, he got the start and, and made the MLR uh, uh, first 15 that week. And now he's, he's booked himself a ticket to, to play in Twickenham and, and in Cardiff. Uh, later next month. He's gone from literally the University of Victoria straight to the show. And uh, Gaz was three steps ahead of all that. She was amazing. I'd never heard of the, the old Lock Kratz Monster General uh, until you guys mentioned him. And then he just started carving it up and, and in the Canadian squad. So that, that's really great to see. I look forward to see who else she uncovers coming up soon. Yeah. And lastly, our, uh, our Canadian sponsor, Gilbert Rugby Canada. Exciting news. Our Gilbert Rugby Hive custom balls uh, will be in the marketplace in the next month here. So stay tuned for that. Can't wait, Robin. That is brilliant. You had a hand in crafting that. And then we want to thank, of course, our partners and our family and friends for all the support and the Rugby Network. They have been brilliant to get us in the eyes of North American fans. The RugbyNetwork.com is where you can get it. We're not as elusive as Homer Simpson's dietitian. You can catch us on the socials at Rugby Hive on Twitter and Facebook, at My Rugby Hive on Instagram, and our website, rugbyhive.com. Time now for Season 2, Episode 26. Right, we, uh, we're thrilled to have both the Moonlight X canadian 7s uh, and 15s internationals, but uh, they both cousins that ended up captaining uh, Canada. So uh, I just... Thrilled to have you both on, and and uh, as I told Dave and John, this is this is an idea that that came to me as far as uh, the story that would later unfold, which it did in many aspects, is John following in Dave's uh, footsteps. But I remember uh, John coming to his first uh, sevens camp, and I was glad I was on my way out with athletes like him on his way in. I knew I knew we had proper athletes in the future, and big, fast, strong, powerful, and uh, just a great uh, Canadian kid at the time. So, uh, welcome to the Rugby High Boys. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us, Dave. Let's let's start with you. Can you give us a bit of insight into your hometown, your home club, and and what sports you grew up playing? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I grew up in uh, Whitby, Ontario. Little small town, um, more of a hockey lacrosse uh, town than anything really. But I grew up playing hockey. I was uh, just a house league hockey player, but played uh, hockey and uh, basketball, volleyball, you know, baseball. Uh, basically played everything and uh, didn't didn't start playing like like a lot of kids in Ontario. You don't start really playing rugby. Take it to high school. So I started playing rugby when I got to got to high school in grade nine. 
And John, your uh, your sports growing up? Yeah, no, I played um, everything you can think of that was at high school. I did a bit of track stuff, uh, football. Uh, I was been into hockey for a while. Never really that good at basketball, I'm sure Dave can remember, but uh, a bit of volleyball, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I pretty much played everything I could. Uh, growing up and through, I grew up in Pickering, so not too far from Whitby. John was definitely he was a good hockey player. Like uh, I remember, you know, obviously being older than him, we would be, uh, you know, going over. He'd be coming to my house, or I'd be coming to his house for family stuff, and we'd be down shooting pucks in in our basements, right? Like that was the kind of stuff we did. But I certainly, you know, w- once he started getting bigger, he was uh, he was a big unit on the, in, in hockey for sure. And how did you, Dave? How did you first find rugby? Because you were the first one in uh, in your family, right? Yeah, actually, um, I was, I, I think I was way more interested in basketball for sure. I was sort of think basketball was, was it, you know, I, I played, spent a ton of time playing basketball. Um, my brother was all over me about playing rugby. He played, he was two years older than me. And as soon as he started playing rugby, he started just bugging me. You got to play, you got to play, you got to play. And, um, I was like not too interested in, uh, got to grade nine, he sort of bugged me to come out, come out. So I came out to a couple of practices. I was ready to quit. I was like, nah, this isn't for me. I'd rather be playing basketball. Um, and he's like, just play one game and, and see how it goes. And I played my first game and I was like, wow, this is, this is awesome. I, and sort of instantly fell in love with the game and just kind of went from there. You credit your brother, which is brilliant. And John, who do you credit for finding the game? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen it out there. But the, the only reason I asked you for the game as well was because of Dave. Kind of the same thing. He gave me the, you should go out, you should go out, you should try it. And kind of question it, question it. And then I uh, finally went out and obviously fell in love with the game. remember the first practice, uh, I looked up all the positions and what positions guys played. And I knew I wanted to be a flanker going out them and had me run around with the backs and that. And immediately I told him, like, no, 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 I got to be here. This is what I want to do. And that. Yeah, so that's how I, I kind of started. Uh, same thing, grade nine. Dave basically convinced me. And that was, uh, I think you were out. Uh, were you at West by then? Probably you would have been at West by at that point. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 So if it wasn't for Dave, you got to give your brother a shout out right now, because if it wasn't for him, there wouldn't be cousins. Two, 200 sorry, cousins. cousins. Sorry. Yeah. If it wasn't for uh, 200 tries scored on uh, the uh, Sevens World Series between the two of you. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've said it for a long time that my brother basically made me play. Uh, and, you know, obviously thankful for that. And, uh, it led to Moonlight in Canada jerseys for a long time. Brilliant. John, what was it like for you as a, as a young teenager as as Dave was jet-setting around the world and, and, and getting it done for Canada as a captain? How did that influence your life? Dave and I's family grew up quite close. Uh, our, cottage, our first cottages we had were right across the water. I kind of I remember growing up there. So we were in a cove on Pigeon Lake in Ontario, and you could swim from my cottage across to Dave's cottage. So we kind of grew up every weekend spending time with each other and I kind of looked up to Dave and, and watched him, you know, that they go out and play a manhunt and I'd be stuck going to bed or something, right? And he was talking about, you know, family events, shooting pucks in the basement. And so when Dave kind of made it, it was a big deal. At that point, there was like the, the Sundays where they would replay all the games. So you'd be able to see, I think it was like once or twice a month, you'd be able to see the games from the last turn that the guys were at. So it was a big thing for myself or my family. We'd sit down, we'd watch couple games that they've been playing you know it was pretty awesome it's pretty cool be able to look up and, and see what he was doing see i remember very distinctly trying to convince him to come out um you know sort of knowing that at that time i mean still to this day really i mean if you want to play rugby you seem to have to be on the west coast for the most part but it, you know junior was going to uh laurier he was playing some rugby there and i just started getting on I'm like you got to get out here this is this is the spot you, you got to get west and um you know i what, what are we junior i'm eight years older than you yeah, eight years something. Yeah, so uh, you yeah, know, I, like I remember like now? <laughs> <laughs> I remember bugging him like, "Hey, like finish at Laurier, get out here. Like this is where you need to be." And like I even remember saying like, "You know, you can live with me," but sort of feeling like, "Hey, ah, guy's probably not going to live with me. Like, you know, he's going to be want to be doing different things than me." But he finally decided that he was going to going to come out, and when he moved out, he moved right in with us, and and kind of went from there. So, and who were you living with at that time, Dave? Uh, BT Brian Taylor. Uh, I think that he was still there, eh, Junior? Uh, he was. He just left as I come back. It was a uh, hurricane was living with us. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Kyle Haley. You meet hurricane, and then uh, Philly Mac, and uh, then we're right next door. Oh yeah, Jamie Collins yeah. right next door. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a we had a bit of a rugby rugby household there. Lots of guys that had played for Canada and 
and uh, played rugby, so it was a pretty fun spot. Good environment for John. So, Dave, what about you? What is it like uh, for you since you've obviously retired internationally and then see John fall in your footsteps and, and most recently, you know, the, the first three years of the Vancouver Sevens in BC play, seeing, uh, seeing Big John get it done? Oh, uh, honestly, it, it was awesome. I mean, uh, it's funny, like funny story, like just, just actually just this week, um, I'm, I'm a teacher, right? So we've been doing some online learning with our classes. So I, my assignment for my rugby class this week was having them watch, uh, was it 2016 when you guys won in Singapore, 16 or 17? Uh, 17. Yeah. 2017 yeah. when they won in Singapore, that was, that was their assignment was to have all those guys watch that. And, uh, I, you know, I said before, but it was one of the coolest things for me uh, was having a conversation with junior not long before that tournament and junior telling me that he's like, we'll win one. We're like, we're going to win one this year. And, and then they, they did it, you know, they, they go in and, uh, you know, beat us in the final, which is always nice beating the U S <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, beating the U S in the final. And then, you know, he, he did the interview afterwards and, you know, it wasn't surprised. He was like, you know, they, he knew that they were going to win and, that was so different than I me. Mean, I can be honest when, when I was playing and Robin, I don't know if you would agree, but I don't know if our belief was we'd ever win a tournament. We went to every tournament hoping we'd get into the top eight. And then, you know, if, if the, if the stars align, you know, see how we can do, but um, to actually believe that you're going to win and actually go and win one was, was unreal. So that was, uh, it was pretty cool for me to be able to watch that and, and, and you know, talk about it and, and then relive it when I watched it there the, the other day. We had a really good grouping at that point. I think that was um, that was right when we had Damien come into the, the squad, and he really kind of brought that belief back into everyone. And that was one of the first, you know, a few times when Garrett was around, we had a little bit of it. And then when Damien came in, he really kind of convinced us and made us believe that we could do it, we could show up. That was probably the, one of my favorite years of rugby, just playing around then, because we just we were carefree. We you know, there was disagreements with Rugby Canada right at the start of the year when it came to contract stuff. And we just wanted to show everyone that, you know, we had arrived and we were, what we were fighting for was Rugby Canada. And that wasn't anything that wasn't worth doing like that. You know, we were going to perform along and try and get what we were trying to do out of them. And that was, uh, that was an awesome year. It's it's interesting, you know, obviously following the, the Sevens program and, and as the moonlights know, it took me forever to actually get a play with Dave. But, uh, you know, until I think it was a year before I started, but, Dave was part of a side that beat Fiji for the first time, you know, and, uh, and then John was part of a side that, you know, it broke a lot of records, but I remember, uh, I think it was 2015, uh, John, you guys were in Japan and you guys upset New Zealand for the first time. And then since then, I think Canada's upset New Zealand, maybe 40, 40 to 60% of the time. And, uh, you know, now that you've, you know, help them get over the hump of, of, of getting a title. Now it's, now it's, it's there for the taking. Right. And uh, that, that sense of belief coming in with a coach like Damien that's been there and done it and won uh, world series tournaments. Uh, that's, I think that's all you guys needed to get over the, get over the stigma of, of, of being number one. Yeah. And that photo of you guys uh, in Hong Kong is a pretty, pretty iconic photo. And uh, it was one that was talked about, uh, a few times, I'm sure Dave and I had talked about it and that, but like, you know, once you once you get past that, I think I beat Fiji three or four times over the years. I, I think I beat every team on the circuit pretty much at this point now. Uh, the guys just knocked off South Africa again. Like, once you get that confidence and you start building and the group was getting confident, there was, there was no one that was going to really, well, Sevens is one of those games anything can happen in a quick amount of time, but, you know, we felt like every game we were going in, we had a good chance of taking it down and actually performing walking away i think it was sterling richmond that had the game winning try and dallin you'd be thrilled because he was also wearing gloves when he scored the try <laughs> <laughs> he's never gonna let this down oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah sterling definitely wore gloves that is a fact <laughs> a good man good man definitely my top three um john let's go back to to your sevens career 65 tournaments on the series a brilliant career and you got to enjoy so many moments with players like phil mack and nate hiriyama and harry jones can you delve a bit deeper into that time period when you guys you know were taking over the world together when i first came in philly mack was uh was kind of leading the, the crew Nate had Nate wasn't even back playing again he was on his kind of year hiatus and uh they'd just gone through that um the world cup here so dave was pushing for it and i like when i kind of just popped into the game we kind of missed each other i played a tournament dave went on those turns right there and then i didn't then i played again he didn't hop in any of them um but from there we kind of had a really good crew that kind of stuck around nate harry 
Phil was there for a while, the bull foul and that we had a we had a really good group of guys that we kinda I guess you know, bonded and, and grew up together and, and really traveled the world. I mean, when you're young and in your twenties everyone wants to travel. We were getting lucky not a lot, but we were getting paid to travel the world and see these places and grow up and become it is it's pretty surreal you think about where you, places you'd be, you know, one day you'd be sitting in Hong Kong, the next day you're in Singapore. Meanwhile, everyone back in Ontario is sitting under three feet of snow and you know, just wait for something so they can go outside. So you know, it was pretty awesome. I uh, I really I really enjoyed it, and um, you know, some of those guys are my best buddies still. I still talk to a few of them here and there every couple of weeks or a month or so. I remember that with with you know, with Junior because uh, I'm sorry he talked about how when he first got in, he was kind of in and out of the team a little bit. He had some uh, unfortunate uh, luck with injuries. Um, but there was a point there that there was like it was like he he flicked the switch, and uh, he really started taking it, taking it more serious. I think early on, and I, I think Junior would agree with me. Early on, he, he, obviously, he was excited to be playing for Canada, but I don't think he had the same uh, sort of drive to be to be the best. And there was like a switch; it went off, and all of a sudden, you know, I, I don't know how many tournaments you played in a row after that first little bit, but I would say bulk of them all happened in a row, right? Unless you got, unless you missed any for injuries, but I don't think you missed many injuries after your initial. No, I think. Um... So I played that first term, and I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It was a conversation you and I had. You called me out because we were, I was out in the sauce or whatever with the guys, and we were going away in a couple of days. And you basically said to me, what are you doing? You realize the opportunity you have and what you're doing, what you, where you could be in the world. And kind of was an eye-opener for me. I think I ended up playing uh, – Rugby Canada pulled me out for one thing when I was going to the 15s. But after that, I played like 50 tournaments straight, something like that. I Which is unreal. That's unreal, right? Yeah. Yeah, I could have been. I could have been in the '60s. I think uh, had that not happened. Yeah, he went from a guy that was always hurt to like you know he was the guy now, and he would be you know he'd come home from a tournament and he'd be sort of saying to me privately like, "Oh, this guy's like he's soft, like he's got to toughen up, right?" Like and and the, and he had you know like I said, flick that switch, and you know we weren't going to keep him off the field. Then you saw that in his play because he was you dominant. Just, you certainly did. Well, it, just my backstory with you guys is that, so I played for the U.S. 2007 was my first year. I played for two or three seasons. And I remember playing against both of you individually, but then I was commentating more recent years. And still when I see, I, you know, you check the program, a moonlight, I'm like, how many moonlights are there? Or it's just, or it's just, are there only two? And have they played for decades? And that's kind of a testament to you guys. You've always been in the team and, and kind of like the iron men of the side, I'll say, you know, so we had Todd Kleber at the time. Well, you guys have one of the moonlights. <laughs> yeah, so I was very fortunate too. Like I'd, uh, you know, I'd come home from trips or anything was going on that I wasn't certain. I was it was easy to sit and talk with Dave. You know, probably I'd say within me coming home within you know a day or two, I'd be over at Dave's house and we'd be talking about kind of how the tournament went, and what I thought, and things that happened. That it was it was nice to have that uh, be able to talk to someone about it because you know a, a lot of people think that you know, when you're traveling the world and you're in all these nice places, you're getting to enjoy yourself and see it. But a lot of the time spent in your hotel room, you know, you're sitting relaxing or work not relaxing, but like waiting to play the game. You guys know, right? You guys all know hotels and practice fields, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I'd say it's, it's very grueling. So, you know, when you try and tell someone, oh, you know, this is what's going on that, they're like, well, geez, you're sitting in, you know, you're sitting in South Africa right now. It can't be that bad. But, you know, it was awesome to do it, but it was really nice having Dave to confide in. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a big part of why we, you know, we, Dal and I put our heads together. So, you know, young athletes out there that don't have a Dave looking over their shoulder, uh, they can they can learn some of your best practices. And, and when we're young, uh, we need somebody older to kind of help guide us and keep us in line. And, uh, I mean, Dave, being my captain through my uh, sevens career, you know, he didn't have to say much. He always led by example, and whether it was in training or game time. And, Dave, you go back to, you know, that sense of belief, Dave's belief when he at least what he portrayed to the team the fire in his eyes and the way he would perform was that he could beat anybody we could beat anybody and uh he was a testament to that but uh going back to that infamous name I don't, you couldn't have a better Canadian last name or a better hockey name than Moonlight I just want to touch on uh you know, although I had an opportunity to play with, with Dave and one of his best friends, Mike Danskin, disc, old Disco Danskin, those guys played both at the University of Victoria and Canada together. And whether it was somewhere on the West Coast of Canada or somewhere in the world, they were they were magic together. And uh, every time uh, um, Danskin would score the, on the World Series, they would play 
uh, Dancing in the Moonlight, which we would tune into Danskin and the Moonlight. But uh, Dave, how was that chemistry for you and, and just playing with somebody you're so well connected with? You know, knew, knew Mike for a long time. We actually played like under 19 rugby together. So we'd known each other for a while and uh, just had a kind of a, yeah, I wouldn't even know if it, at under 19, we were really buddies at that point, but um, we just sort of, you know, your relationship kind of grows off the field through all the, tra- all the time you spend training. And yeah, we just, we sort of seem to have a, uh, a good chemistry on the field. And yeah, he's, he's a guy that we've kind of followed kind of similar paths, right? He's a teacher, I'm a teacher, and we both stay pretty active. And it was funny, our parents were, were friends too. So um, not long ago, I think our, the Danskins and the Moonlights got together and they were watching some old, uh, some old sevens games. So um, it was pretty funny having them, having my, my old man and, and, and Danskins old man having a, having a BS about uh, some of the old tournaments. And they, you know, when they would come, when we play in LA, they would always come and they'd hang out, have a nice time. And uh, it was, it was good. It was good. We, de- definitely one of my good friends that I, I've, had from rugby for sure speaking of the moonlight i do recall commentating a game and our director canada was playing we're calling the game and john had the ball or something in the break in play and we zoomed in on him and then we panned up to uh the moon that was beautiful image of it too. so <laughs> I, I don't know if you remember that john one of the games it was pretty oh cool, i didn't you know? hear the end of it for a while <laughs> so let, let's switch to 15s uh in more recent times john you played in the first ever professional uh, league major league rugby in north america you represented toronto arrows for a bit what was that experience like and and what does it mean to have a professional 15 setup yeah you know it was a fun experience it was kind of something um something for me to try uh, my leaving a rugby was really abrupt uh i got the, the job two years today is uh my official start date was you know i uh, i had to get up and walk away pretty quickly and i don't think i was quite ready to say goodbye to it all and uh so that was kind of another opportunity they gave me a chance when i could make it there i could come and train with them and do which games and that but I enjoyed it. It was fun to play there. We had a decent crowd in Toronto. I think like the highest was like 3,800 or something like that. Uh, people came out to play on court. It's tough to fight with the, the wolf packs that they're kind of ground here. They've got really good following. They're wanting people out. And Bill Webb and them are doing great things. I think it'll hopefully keep growing. As I knew eventually I had to, I had to hang them up. Like at that point, that last kind of season there, the, it broke me. I think I played three full 80-minute games within eight days. And that was the point I knew I was done. I had to kind of worry about my own sanity. I Near the end, I didn't really enjoy 15s at all. I'm sure a lot of people knew this, but I preferred to be on the sevens pitch more. I always felt like we were more competitive. It was just, it was a more fun game to me. So the, the last bit was fun, but, you know, it wasn't exactly what I wanted. And then the way my body was feeling, I knew it was time to step away. Well, you're still in amazing shape. So would you play a social game every now and again, or you you completely done with rugby? Uh, I made a little trip down to Bermuda in November. There was talk about maybe trying to make a sevens comeback. I went down to LA and played for uh, the Upright Rogues. I don't think it's going to, I think that'll probably be the end for anything for me. It's just even that two day tournament, my body's feeling a bit and I'm starting to think about other stuff in life. You know, I don't want to get hurt. Like I'm looking at buying a new bike right now, right? Like I want to enjoy that kind of stuff. I've always wanted to do uh, Ironman. So I'm kind of prepping to maybe do something like that. So. Well, I don't think there's anything harder in your body than the Bermuda Classics. I went on one of those trips, and I I took it easier than I think everybody, like absolutely everybody. I, I hit out from the team just just to not ruin my entire life. And those guys are those guys are weapons. And then they get out, and you get to go play. But I I was just like a kid though. Is this rolling subs, Dal? Have you been down? Uh, no, not yet. Been invited, but but been too scared to go. There, there's 60 minute time. games. It's You're rolling time. subs. It's like hockey subs, and uh, I didn't sub off once because I'm just like a kid. I want to be on the field, but uh, but yeah, there's some there's some professionals off fielders. Best best experience going. Uh, I'm gonna put you both on the spot here, and uh, we'll go with seniority first. Dave, who is your best roommate ever on tour, and why? Oh wow, uh, yeah. When I looked at these questions earlier, uh, I was trying to. Uh, I was trying to think of my best roommate and I was trying to think of some funny stories, but uh, I, I, it sounds, it sounds silly, but I, I can't think, I can't pick a, a single guy. I, we had, I had so many good teammates, you know, a guy like Kyle Haley and men Danskin that we mentioned and a guy like Me- Neil Meachin and some of these guys are, you know, they're still buddies. I'm still buddies with and still close with. So obviously uh, enjoyed, you know, spending time with them, but you know, most of our coaches, you, you, you know, you sort of switch up who you're rooming with every week anyways. And I, I can't really remember having anybody that I was really hiding from or, or really wanting to have. So we had a pretty good team chemistry for the most part, I think. 
And I don't, I don't think anybody get out of hand rooming with the captain anyway. They're, they're too afraid. Uh, John, John, how about you? I roomed with everyone. I was the same thing, kind of rotated. My, uh, one of my favorite roommates, I only ever roomed with him once, was uh, Tony Lecart. I had him uh, my first tournament in Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he can be quite the character off the field and that stuff. Got, yeah, got any stories for us? Oh, nothing, nothing I can speak of right now that I can think of speaking of. But, uh, no, he was, Tony was awesome. I just really enjoyed my time with him. He helped get me prepared for the tournament and that. And then, yeah, off the field, he was just a, he's just a character, right? Like a funny guy all the time. When I talked to Robin earlier today, we both, he, well, he mentioned about Tony being his worst roommate. And I would no. put, I would put Tony in the, the worst roommate category too. I, I still play hockey with Tony and, uh, He's definitely the stinky guy. He got to stay away from his hockey bag. It stinks. <laughs> yeah, I was still young, right? I guess I didn't, uh, didn't get too many times with the uh, old Tone. Tone was a mess, man. These guys' gear was a mess. Like, <laughs> yeah, but that's what all the kids these days are like, man. You walk into a hotel room with any of these young guys now, and there's stuff everywhere. I Robin, you gotta room. tell you, Robin, you gotta tell your story about how he sleeps. Yeah, so we had here Yam on here a few few weeks ago, and uh, yeah, his best roommate was T because it was his, it was his first roommate as well. I don't know if that was like an initi- initiation for those coaches back in the day, but yeah, my worst one was Tony, and 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 I love Tony for sure. But we all got sick in Hong Kong, or half the team got sick in Hong Kong, and and Dave and I got sick on the way to Singapore. I remember being at dinner at Singapore the first night we got there. And I kind of threw some symptoms out to the boys that already had it. And they're like, yeah, you're going to get it. So anyway, I wake up in the middle of the night, first night in Singapore. I don't know where I am. Still hurting from the, the last night in Hong Kong. And uh, I wake up in the middle of the night, flick on the light, and there's there's Tony with his arms crossed and his mouth wide open and his eyes half open and he's, and he's, <laughs> he's asleep. <laughs> I've never been more freaked out in my life. So the rest of the week, I, I slept with a light on because I was just frightened of, of, of tea. But uh, I room with him again in Edinburgh and he was, he was good humor. Yeah. I had a funny, funny story, and it's sort of fitting to what, what's going on now with the pandemic. Um, when we were in uh, Hong Kong in 2003 is when the, the SARS thing was going on. So we're in Hong Kong. We're supposed to be going to Beijing the following week, but they, you know, mid, midweek uh, in Hong Kong, they were going to cancel. They canceled Beijing. Anyways, we play the tournament, usual Hong Kong tournament, same crowd as always and everything else. First time tour for Christoph Struben. In Hong Kong during the harsh the SARS uh, pandemic, I guess I, I don't know if that was a pandemic too, but it, either way, nothing really seemed to change in Hong Kong. Uh, so we play our tournament. We know we're not going to Beijing the next week, so we he- head out to the to the local uh, nightclubs after the fact. Christoph on his first tour ends up in a Hong Kong hospital on an IV because he like <laughs> p- p- passed out in a cab, <laughs> and uh, and he you know he gets back to the hotel in the morning again, the SARS thing's going on. He's like, I was in a hospital in Hong Kong during the SARS, had to like pull out his IV and like ran out of the hospital to get back. So he didn't like miss his flight to back home the next day. So it was pretty funny. Wow, I don't know that, if Christoph will like me telling that story, but it's pretty funny. Well, it's kind of good telling stories about other people. So you, you remain calm. They're the ones that get shredded on the, right. on the cost. I love it. Wow. That, that's pretty crazy. I've heard <laughs> of crazy stuff, but that, that's pretty scary indeed. Let's, uh, let's switch gears to your favorite try you ever scored, and it could be 7s or 15s. And we'll start with you, John. Oh, geez. <laughs> this, this is tough. I mean, got to be I that winner said, in Vancouver. That, that was big, yeah, but like, it wasn't for anything crazy. Uh, there's one against Fiji in uh, – in Wellington, actually, that stands out because BG were knocked down into the bowl. We were playing them in the bowl final. Kind of see their attitude as they were walking around. Like they just felt like they were going to walk over us. And uh, I can remember making a break down the sideline. This is kind of when I was first coming into myself and feeling like I was a player. And I got a good stiff arm in on one of the guys right in the middle of the chest and ran around. And uh, that would probably that would probably be up there as probably one of the top ones. Or their. Uh, yeah, that one in Vancouver. I mean, that's, the commentators uh, seem to sell me pretty well on that. Absolutely. I mean, the crowd erupted. Yeah. Everyone's going berserk. I love, those are iconic moments that will stay with, uh, you know, not only with you, obviously, being so close to the action, but everyone else that was there, you know. And how about yourself, Dave? I, I, I got to go back to the my very first uh, my first try and sort of kind of a funny story to go along with it. My very first try came at my second tournament. First tournament was in Brisbane, 2003. Second tournament was in Wellington. First game in Wellington, playing Fiji, score a try. While I'm scoring the try, I break my hand. 
So like continued, you know, we didn't know it was broken. We just sort of were, were dealing with it, played the rest of the tournament. Like, again, that's sort of like my, my first real tournament, uh, had a great tournament. Like, I think I ended up scoring, like, I think I might've scored eight tries that tournament, which I don't think I, I was, I don't think I ever scored eight tries in a tournament again, but did it well after I broke my hand. And then, so after the tournament, we get x-rayed, find out my hand is broken, like kind of get home, have to have surgery and try to rush to get back. So I didn't miss the next tournament. So the first try was pretty memorable. Well, Dave, you scored more tries in your first tournament than I did in my entire career. So uh, <laughs> it's not too bad with a broken hand. Same for me, actually. So, you know, for us, it's easy to pick our favorite try because there's so few. Dave, let's stay with you. You played both 15s, of course, and, and, and sevens, but what drew you more to sevens uh, and becoming the first Canadian to score 100 tries on the series? I, Junior talked about it before uh, earlier there, but just uh, the fact that you get to you travel the world, you play in all these these cool places in front of big crowds. I think I enjoyed the the fact that on any given day we can we could beat we could beat anybody. And we did, you know, we beat some, we beat some big teams. This is, I guess, my 15s bias, but I think it would be like an absolute miracle for Canada to knock off one of the top, you know, three countries in the world, right? It's just not going to, in an 80 minute game, I, I can't see it happening. Uh, so that, I think that I really enjoyed that um, going on a few 15s tours. It just wasn't the same, different, different group of guys. I was, I, I think I was frustrated because you'd go on a 15s tour or you go on a sevens tour you know you're going to play everybody on the on the roster is going to, is going to play minutes. You go on a 15 store, you might dress one game or start one game, and then the next game you might not dress. Uh, and that happened to me a couple of times, or you, you know you don't dress, and that's a long week when you're just uh, you know you're training every day and know you're not going to be playing or even putting on your uniform. So after kind of a couple of years, kind of with 15s, it was like yeah, uh, I'm I'm quite happy playing sevens and and just playing sevens. The listeners out there, so. In our in our playing days, we only had Dave. Nowadays, they have they've got guys like John that are big, strong, and fast, and they can play six games in a weekend. Back then, we would just give the ball to Dave, or Dave would have to make the tackle, get the get the ball, and then go ninety meters, and we'd hope he'd he'd make it over the line because none of us could catch up to him. Yeah, literally. Yeah, I don't know how finish. you remember it that way. I, I certainly wasn't going ninety meters, man. No way. <laughs> well, it was eighty nine meters when you didn't make it, but uh, either way, we could barely see you. Um, and then, yeah, nowadays, I mean, they got so many horses, well conditioned machines, but uh, poor Dave, he literally, I mean, he's selfless and humble. But I remember being on the other end of the field, just going like, I wish I could be there. And then he would have to play six games. So by the time we get to the business end of the tournament, we'd almost played him out because we had nobody to go on for him. But Dave, you really set the platform for your younger cousin there. And, and just to transition back to John here. So you played in 15s and 7s World Cups, Commonwealth Games, a couple Pan Am game golds. What is, what is your favorite moment or favorite few moments in a Canadian jersey? Uh, number one is obviously winning that tournament. Um, you know, Dave and I were talking, you know, he said before, saying I wanted to win, I think, there was a quote, actually, uh, not even Patrick Johnson had it in one of his articles saying that uh, I wanted to win a tournament before I could kind of walk away. And then it happened right, two months later or whatever. So that, that was obviously a big moment for me. A lot of it was kind of the off-field stuff. I really enjoyed it a lot. We had a, such a good group of guys that, you know, we come home from a tour, you do with these guys for two and a half weeks. And next thing you know, you're hanging out with them you know, at a coffee shop the next morning or whatever. Right? Like I, Those were probably the kind of the highlights for me that our third place or sorry not third place second place in scotland when we made our first final that was a pretty big one i know we got a shellacking from new zealand there but uh that was kind of a, a turning point for us i was with garen and he actually left after that tour we went over to england and then he went down to us too this kind of a turning point for us that we realized that we could kind of compete so those would be kind of the two major spots for me dave how about for you highlights i, I think the 2003 beating <laughs> fiji and hong kong when we beat uh, a really memorable one for me was when we beat uh, South Africa in LA in, in sort of in front of our, our families and, and friends. And that there was a, a kind of an interesting uh, game there because we beat South Africa. I think our next game was Samoa. We lost to Samoa. Yeah. And we, you were at that one. Yeah. And then we had to play Mexico. Yeah. And then in Mexico, we get, you know, it's like, we're looking at to, to get through to the cup round in front of our families. We have to put 70 on Mexico you know, we're all sort of fired up to try and uh, accomplish that. We, you know, kick off Mexico scores to go up and we're all kind of looking at each other like, holy, we got a long way to go here. And uh, it just started one way traffic. And I was like one of the tiredest I've ever been in that game. We were just uh, score 
sprint back, pick off, get it back, score, score, score. And we ended up, uh, we ended up, I think it might have been 76 5, I think it might have been. 80, 87 5. Oh, man, you got a better memory than me. But yeah, we ended up getting the, getting the 70 and then getting into the, uh, into the cup round in front of our family. So it was, uh, that, that, that was a pretty, pretty fun weekend. Um, 2006 Commonwealth Games, um, just the Commonwealth Games experience was unreal for me. We had sort of targeted Scotland as being the team that we really wanted to beat. We've been watching game tape and really sort of focused on trying to beat that team. And, and we, we, we beat them, which was, which was, which was awesome to beat them on that stage. We had, uh, we had Clark Laidlaw, who is the current all black sevens coach and he was in that side. So uh, we were, we were sharing stories about that, how Dougie, Doug Tate had that one play over the top with Dansk and cutting their yeah. first receiver in half. And, and uh, that was the only, only trick Doug ever pulled out of his sleeve. And, and, uh, and of course it was, go- it was pure gold, but going back to that, that Mexico upset. So we beat out, we beat South Africa, South Africa beat Samoa, Samoa beats us. And of course, South Africa and Samoa, put a licking on Mexico. And uh, so we, yeah, like Dave said, we had to put over 70 points on them. We didn't score until five minutes into the game. So that if you do the math, that's nine minutes, 87 points in nine minutes. I was one of the only guys that stayed on the field, Alan, and I didn't score a try. So uh, just give the ball to the athletes and Dave had a field day. It was, it was unbelievable. Yeah, those are a couple of good memories. John, let's, uh, let, let's talk a bit about you playing a decade on the series or longer. Uh, can you tell us about your, your, how you evolved as a player? You know, when you first started out to, to being an absolute versatile powerhouse playing every second, you know, in, in the last bit of your career. I never actually saw myself as a sevens player. So that trial that Robin had mentioned, the only reason I was out there was Doug Tate kind of gave me the, hey, you should kind of go out here. This would be a good fit for you and that. And so I went out, kind of started with all a really good speed test good fitness score and that kind of kick-started myself getting involved with all I went and trained with the national program got myself in the seven when I first came in I didn't you know you look up to players looking at like a Kleberger was playing my position at that point Chauncey O'Toole had just come in kind of the same turn as me he was playing really well there was a lot of good players I then I never really put myself kind of on par with them and it wasn't until I started kind of believing in myself and and then pushing that I actually started getting myself a starting position on the squad. And I was uh, a couple of years into it that, uh, that I actually got myself to start. The game's changing so much, though. Every day you look at it, it's so much faster. People are so much bigger. Uh, I was watching the, that tournament down in LA when I was there. And uh, some of the guys, even like Harry and Nate, look like they're, you know, five, ten pounds heavier than they were before. My game was always simple. I just kind of wanted what I was doing on the field to speak for itself. I didn't. Uh, I think I hate losing more than I ever like winning at anything. Uh, pretty much anything. Can't remember the last time I played Dave in squash because he would have absolutely put me in the box these days. So that really drove me and it pushed me out there. I'm sure you can see in game film. I never gave up in a play. I was always chasing through. And that's what I kind of uh, lived for playing was that uh, I was, I knew I was going to be fitter than the guy across from me and that I wasn't going to give up and I was going to do what I could to make sure that we won. I think with, with Junior, one of the things that was interesting is he was one of those guys that, you know, obviously he was a stalwart on the sevens team, regular on the sevens team, but the 15s teams wanted him. But he's a guy that uh, you know, I always believed that to do what they wanted him to do in 15s was taken away from his sevens because they always wanted him to get bigger, 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 get bigger, get bigger, right? And, uh, you know, and I think, you know, if Junior had have, you know, got as big as they wanted him to get, he maybe, you know, he potentially loses some of that, that speed and explosiveness that, he, that made him such a, you know, a beast in sevens, right? I like to call it slow speed. It makes it look like you're going slow, but somehow it passed them. I don't know how it works. Let's touch on a little bit uh, some of the challenges that you faced uh, individually as as in your career. So, Dave, we start with you. Any challenge you had to overcome? Well, I guess I I, uh, I guess it's a challenge because it's what I see what those guys do and what Junior would tell me what their what their training looked like. Um, you know, those guys were in a fully professional training environment where. In my time, when we were playing, you you basically played sevens on weekends, or you you'd have a camp before you go away for for your two tournaments, and then you get back and you know you were expected to be at Tuesday or Thursday practice to play fifteens with your club team. So that was a challenge, right? Because again, as I'm saying with junior, like the the transfer over from sevens to fifteens is is big. Um, and I remember going back to UVic after you know after sevens, uh, and some of the guys were we're kind of talking about that because, you know, the, I think the year before we, some of the sevens guys that came back and came back for our playoff game and the sevens guys didn't play very well. But again, we were all expected to, to come and play 15. So 
that was definitely a challenge. Uh, I love sevens. I, I would have just, I would have absolutely loved to do it, what junior did and, and been a, a full-time sevens player, not half, as much as I enjoyed my 15s, playing 15s with my clubs, sevens, a hundred percent would have wished I could have been in that, that professional environment. You were a big part of, you know, what, what led that environment to make that challenge or sorry, make that transition into a full-time environment. So, I mean, we always want to leave it better than when we got it and we always want better for the next generation. So you're, you know, you're a big, big piece of that. So John, what about you? What were some challenges that you had overcome? I mean, over the years, there was always when David that kind of touched on the fact that injuries when I first started, I seemed I just stared at something and I ended up hurting my back or something. I broke my leg in there, shoulder, and I think I broke my hand three times within nine months or something like that. Uh, so kind of once I got over that, there was a draw to go overseas. I had an opportunity, to, especially after the World Cup in 2015, there's teams sending kind of stuff, but that never really pushed me. One of the toughest things we had to kind of get over was um, when they brought in Liam Milton, it kind of fractured the, the team quite a bit. It took quite a bit of work between guys and all of us trying to get it back to where it was with Damien. That, that was probably the toughest thing that we, uh, we had to get over. I got put in some pretty tough positions over the years and or over that year, and uh, it was tough. It was it was hard for everyone involved in that and the whole program. And you know, there was that points there. I think I was close to walking away from it all, and uh, you know, I'm glad I didn't at the time. But you know things happen you move on from them the team is obviously better from that than the end. and john i got a i got a question do you have the same taste in music as your older cousin you guys have a lot in common but you guys got the same taste in music <laughs> no chance not a chance <laughs> uh, you know what he said he had me go to a couple metal concerts and i'd, I'd be i was wearing khakis once at a metal concert i remember we were sitting in the cars waiting uncle willie and then we're supposed to jamie and then we're supposed to come meet us and I remember you saying something like, what are you wearing? And I was wearing like, yeah, khaki pants going into this concert. No, it wasn't not quite mine. I'll listen to anything but that basically. I don't I don't think but I, I would have been able I wouldn't have been able to sleep uh, after that concert, I don't think. All metal all the time. We were we were in LA after the LA sevens before I the year before I played for Canada and uh Dave and Disco and some of the guys that were in the team, we watched them at the LA sevens and then they jumped in the in the university bus because they're also students at UVic and then we would we had a bit of a Cal, California tour and uh and Doug Tate, the legendary Doug Tate, he had back then it was it was you'd burn CDs. So Doug burnt, I think, fourteen different CDs and he just downloaded every song with the word California. So you would have crazy graphic rap right to, you know, the Beach Boys. And, and the, the, the whole focus of this 14-day trip driving was that nobody could hit, you couldn't you couldn't change the song. And Doug just had it cranked. Doug, that's the kind of guy he is. But anyhow, there's Dave with his headphones on, his big earmuffs, and then his hood over, all black everything. And uh, I was just, you know, after day four, I was like, Dave, like, what's going on in there? I want to listen to what he's just dead serious. You don't want to do it. Like you just, you do not want to know what I put it on. And I took it off. I was like, uh, no wonder he's such an intense guy and such an intense player. But uh, yeah, he's got a different taste of music than this cowboy. Guys, uh, I want to close out on my side. Um, and we'll leave the music for one moment. But for all the young kids, the aspiring sports and rugby players out there, young boys and girls, what advice would you give to them? They're about to start their journey. Uh, Dave, we'll start with you. I get to work with a lot of these young, you know, these young people being, being uh, a high school coach. And it's just hard work, honestly. A, a junior, I think, is a pretty good testament to that, how hard he worked um, to have such a long, long career. I, I sort of tell my guys all the time that you got to get reps. You got to have the ball in your hands uh, and you, you got to be fit. Nobody's going to give you anything. And uh, I try to get my, my high school guys to play as much sevens as they can because, again, I think that even if they end up playing 15s later on, the skills that they're going to get from sevens is, is, is crucial to being a good rugby player. The catch pass, tackling in space, uh, running in space, footwork, all those sorts of things I think are, are key rugby skills and uh, they transfer over to whatever, whatever sport you're going to, or, you know, whatever code of rugby you're going to decide to play, but you're not getting anywhere without the hard work. Brilliant. And you, John? I, I think I just tell kids not to, um, I think especially when they're young, not to just focus on one sport and, you know, you might love playing rugby or something like that, but you got to play everything. There's so much to learn. You can burn out so quickly if you just focus on one thing. A lot of people used to ask me in my career, you see this game or this super rugby game and I'd be so tired of it, you know, after a day of training and looking at our game film that, that I couldn't even watch any more rugby. You know, when I was younger, I never thought that rugby was going to be like, 
I was like every other kid in Ontario who thought he was going to play in the NHL, right? And playing hockey. And I play in all the any other sport I could. I was doing that. making sure that you're you're playing everything you can, and then you can focus as you get older and, and hone in on what you like and what you enjoy. We got to do a better job, I think, in our, like, well, maybe not just Ontario, but all in Canada, of creating a pathway for these kids. I'm getting a lot of kids now that are contacting me and saying, "How can I make it? What do I have to do to get there?" You know, should I be going to university? Should I be trying to get an MLR team? I want to play sevens. Should I be playing for this kind of invitational team? And the pathway, I know they say there's a pathway right now for kids, but the pathway is uh, is not a, a straight line. There's no streamline for anyone in the pathway. And we need to make it easier for a kid to, to kind of know, like if he wants to get seen, a young guy that's playing sevens and doesn't really want to play 15s, if he wants to play sevens, get seen. Well, this is where you can go. If you do this, you might get seen, you can get seen here. And that's going to be something that, has to be straightened out kind of from the the upper end down, I believe. Now that's a great point, especially the ones that are watching your, you know, 2017 championship run, you know, in the sevens and things like that. You're aspiring a new, a new generation. Well, what I want to thank you guys so much. We have a record on our podcast today, 230 tries scored between us four, but what I will say is two, 223 were between the two moonlights. So really such a pleasure, such an honor to have you guys on. Thanks very much for having us. Yeah, it's thanks for having us. Awesome. You guys are absolutely sensational. Appreciate the time, guys, and keep safe that side. And re- really good to, to catch up uh, finally in a friendly setting, not in the war zone on the rugby field. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks a yeah. lot, boys. Cheers, Take thanks. care. Thank you for listening, you sleek sensations. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Rugby Hive Podcast and catch us on all the socials at Rugby Hive. We appreciate your support. Be safe out there and we'll see you soon. They've taken the lunch money from Sunday.